Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials on various topics that might interest you. Today we're continuing the discussion of various distribution fitting tests. In previous videos we have already discussed the two perhaps most famous tests for goodness of fit, that is the Kolmogorov Smirnov test and the Anderson Darling test. The today's hero is a little bit less well known, albeit it's still a very powerful test to check whether the empirical data that you investigate does really fit well some theoretical law that you suspect it might follow. And it's called the Kerpes test. So to start applying the Kerpes test, the preliminary work is exactly the same as for the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, for example. So here we've got five years worth of S&P 500 returns, and we have recorded how many observations we've got, as usual, 1,258. And we have calculated the sample average, the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation. What we need to do now is to sort the returns from smallest to largest. We can do it using the new Excel sort function or using the data sort tab, where we continue with the current selection and sort column C smallest to largest. And we've got our returns sorted from the very negative ones. So the lowest return was minus 4.1% and the highest was 4.96%. And now we need to assign ranks to those, and that's really easy. So the lowest observation would have a rank of 1, and uh, the following observations from smallest to largest will have ever-increasing ranks. So the highest observation would naturally have the rank of 1258. And now we need to convert those ranks into the empirical distribution function. To do that, we just need to divide each rank by the total number of observations, and we need to lock the row over here so that it doesn't change from cell to cell. So here the logic is re really clear. It shows um, how many observations, which percentage of the observations does not exceed a particular value of the return. So here we have uh, approximately 0.08% and the highest observation has an empirical distribution function value of 1, so 100%. And now we need to check uh, whether our theoretical distribution does really fit our empirical distribution well and as a baseline case let's just code a simple normal distribution with uh, the mean and standard deviation that match uh, the sample values so let's just code the normal distribution and uh, say that we'll have our x value equal to the respective return our mean will be equal to the sample mean our standard deviation would be equal to the sample standard deviation will lock the rows in both cases and then we need to assign the cumulative distribution function for the normal distribution that is true or one which is the mathematical equivalent of true and we enforce the formula bottom of the click all the way down and now if we were to apply the kolmogorov smirnov test we would just calculate the absolute differences for example uh, abs for absolute difference between the empirical distribution and the theoretical distribution. We would have enforced it all the way down. Then we would have calculated the supremum using the maximum function. So maximum absolute deviation from the uh, empirical distribution. Then we would have calculated the kolmogorov smirnov statistic using the supremum. So the supremum times the square root of the number of observations. So here it's 1258. So we would have the Kolmogorov Smirnov statistic of 3.6. And uh, if we bear in mind that the critical value for 1% is around 1.5, we could uh, reasonably suggest that the uh, data does not really match the normal distribution as the observed value of the statistic exceeds the critical value. Or alternatively, we could have calculated the p-value using the Kolmogorov Smirnov formula using the exponent of minus supremum squared times the number of observations and we would have a p-value that's very close to zero it means that the probability that the distribution of uh, s&p 500 returns is indeed normal 
is negligible close to zero. That means that the uh, theoretical law of distribution is violated. The stock returns do not follow the normal distribution. So that's just the recap, what, would, what we would have done if we were to abide by the kolmogorov smirnov test. The Kuiper test, on the other hand, uses a slightly modified logic. It's overall a modification of the kolmogorov smirnov test that treats positive and negative deviations from the um, empirical distributions differently. And here we have the logic of D plus, positive deviations, and D minus, negative deviations. So here we have F of X i so it is basically the uh, theoretical distribution that we want to fit. And uh, I over N or I minus 1 over N are just the values of the empirical distributions. So scaled ranks, ranks adjusted for the sample size. So to calculate the positive deviations, we need, to, first of all, uh, to calculate the rank divided by the number of observations. So I divided by n, and we need to lock n because it doesn't change observation to observation. And then we need to sub subtract the value of the theoretical distribution, so f of x i. And then we need to bottom it all the way down. For the d minus, so negative deviations from the um, empirical distribution function, we need to do the reverse. We need to first uh, input the value of the theoretical distribution function, and then we need to subtract i minus 1, so rank minus 1, over the number of observations n. And here we lock the row as well. And then we bottom bracket it all the way down, and then we can already calculate the value of the Kerber test statistic, which is notated v over here. So the formula is really simple and intuitive. Here we basically, if we compare it to the kolmogorov smirnov test, are separating the supremum into positive and negative deviations and treat them separately. So for the maximum positive deviation, we just apply the max function to this area of D plus, and we get 6.58%. And for the maximum negative deviation, we apply the maximum function to the D minus array, and we get 10.33%. And now we can calculate the Kerber statistic by just adding the two together and multiplying it by the square root of the total number of observations. Here it's B1. And we get the Kerber statistic of roughly 6, 5.997. Now we need to convert the Kerber statistic into a respective p-value that would tell us what is the probability, according to the Kerber test, that the S&P 500 returns do really follow the normal distributions. If we treat uh, negative and positive deviations from the empirical distribution functions separately. So here the procedure of calculating the p-value is not as straightforward as for the kolmogorov smirnov test, and uh, Kerber himself has shown that one can do it by summing the following infinite series. So here the logic is slightly similar to the kolmogorov smirnov test. We already have the exponent of um, some negative value that has supremum squared, which would be similar to what we have here. But here we have to consider um, a number of different cases for the values of t, which is the parameter that we change and sum this infinite series from 1 all the way to infinity. And um, here, if uh, you know something about um, infinite series and summing infinite series, if the series is convergent, then basically higher uh, values of the uh, series uh, would be close to zero because this series is indeed convergent as here we raise e to the power of negative 2t squared times v squared. So for t... Uh, equal to 10, for example, we will already have e to the power of minus 200, and then we we'll, would also multiply the uh, power by v squared, so we would get a very, very small number here. So what we really need is some first uh, few uh, entries of this infinite series, and we'll get a very accurate um, approximation of our true p-value. Here, I've decided to calculate the first 
10 values of this infinite series so let's go with it so the term of the series would be 2 times the brackets that consist of 4 times t squared and t again is just a number that varies from 1 to positive infinity then we need to multiply it by the Kerper statistic and the Kerper statistic needs to be locked as we don't want it to change term to term squared then we need to subtract 1 and close the parentheses and then we need to multiply it by the exponent we've talked so much about previously so the exponent of minus 2 times t squared times the Kerper statistic and it should be locked again squared and that's our first term and then we can bottom right click it all the way down and get our values for all 10 terms of interest and as we see here the uh, notion that uh, this infinite series converges to zero very quickly so the p value can be approximated very accurately by just considering the first few terms is accurate because even for the third term we already have a very small number that's 1.73 times 10 to the power of minus 278 so a ridiculously abysmally small number so then we just need to apply the summation operator so sum those 10 first terms in the series and we'll get a p-value that is even closer to zero than in the case of the Kolmogorov Smirnov test so what does it mean it means that the Kuiper test has allowed us to treat the deviations of the theoretical distribution function from the empirical distribution function in positive and negative directions separately and obtain an even more precise estimate of how well does it fit the data and the answer is that it fits the data ridiculously poorly even if we had a Kuiper statistic that would have been smaller for example around 1 we would still have for our p-value calculation a really clear case of convergence as we see here this is basically 81 percent this is one percent and then the series quickly converge to zero so this p-value that we would have obtained if our Kuiper statistic in some imaginary scenario would have been one um, the p-value here it would be close to one so in that case we would have um, stuck with the null hypothesis that the normal distribution does indeed fit well here the p-value is almost entirely uh, determined by the first couple of terms of this infinite series so even if your theoretical distribution does fit the empirical distribution quite well considering just the first few terms of this infinite series to calculate the p-value would indeed do but in our case we've got an even higher Kerber statistic so even from the first term we could have suggested that nothing really fits and uh, S&P 500 returns are indeed not normally distributed and as for now it has been proven by three tests in a row so we can be absolutely sure that normal distribution is a no-go when you try to approximate real world stock market data if you would like to see what other distributions one might use to have a better approximation of these types of data please check our mathematical finance playlist where we have already examined more than 10 different candidate distributions but as for now that's all there is for the Kuiper goodness of fit test and respective applications to the S&P 500 data please don't forget to subscribe to our channel leave a like under this video if you found it helpful and I'm eager to see further suggestions on any videos on business economics or finance you want me to record in the future thank you very much and stay tuned